Don't worry, I'll get it right. <laughs> All right, good afternoon. The clock has gone past high noon, so it's afternoon, and we are at the Geology Roundback. I'm here, Mira is here, you're here, and many of you are out there wherever you are. Um, so I'm delighted to see you guys today, and I'm very excited for Mira to talk about work she's carried over the last two summers that is truly out of this world. So Mira is a geology senior. She'll be graduating in December, and she's going to take us on a geologic trip to space, and uh, we're going to come out of space and end up in Europa. So let's welcome Mira. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking your lunch time to come be here. I really appreciate it. All right, so here's just a brief overview of what I'll be covering in this presentation. I'll be explaining the significance of Europa as a satellite body, and then I'll go into more depth in my study area, which is the Bright Plains region. All right, so this is Europa. Um, as you all know, it's one of Jupiter's many moons, as you saw in the title. It's the sixth largest moon in our solar system and is a bit smaller than our own moon. On the right is a cross section, huge right here. Um, it is assumed to have an ice shell that encases a vast ocean with a rocky mantle and core underneath. Although this model is theoretical and most of the things I will be talking about are theoretical, evidence does support the existence of a saltwater ocean. However, some models argue it's not an ocean, but rather a layer of warm convecting ice. Regardless, NASA's Galileo spacecraft made 12 flybys from the year 1995 to 2003, and it detected a magnetic field within Europa. And scientists believe the most likely option for its causing this is a global salty ocean. So regardless of if you think it's an ocean or warm ice, the surface of the moon has a lot of information ingrained into the surface. The ice shell is said to have one of the youngest surfaces. It's constantly changing and getting replaced by newer ice from beneath. For most moons, you can commonly see meteor impact craters like on our own moon. Uh, however, Europa doesn't have many. So this led scientists to believe that some geological activity is happening that could be erasing those craters from the surface. However, for me personally, one of the most interesting aspects about the moon is the possible presence of a system of plate tectonics. Besides Earth, uh, Europa is the only other planetary body that could potentially display this type of system. So plate boundaries within the ice move and tilt on the watery surface that could potentially create some of the surface features I will be showing you in a little bit. Not only does it potentially have a system of plate tectonics, it's also considered to be a promising option for discovering life. So why study Europa at all? What is the significance of Europa? So it's a lot farther from the sun than our own planet. Its days are equivalent to about three and a half Earth days, and a solar year is about 12 Earth years. And it's approximately minus 160 degrees Celsius. And to convert that, it's minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, regardless of all of this, astrobiologists who study the origin, evolution, and future of life uh, in the universe believe Europa has an abundant amount of water and the right chemical elements to sustain life. But the third piece of that equation is an energy source, and it has been difficult to confirm one on Europa. So Europa has an atmosphere. It's a very tenuous atmosphere of oxygen, but within the last few years, the Hubble Space Telescope found evidence of the moon actively venting water into space. And this means Europa is geologically active now. The presence of water creates the possibility of dissolving nutrients for organisms, and not to mention the transportation of important chemicals. But for Europa to even be potentially habitable, it needs not just oxygen, but hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. All these chemical elements could likely be present on Europa as the moon formed, but nobody knows yet. So the chemistry of Europa, the other part of the water chemistry and energy, um, is important to understand because the life forms that would potentially have at the moon wouldn't be photosynthesis based they would get their energy from chemical reactions. So Europa's surface is constantly being blasted by radiation from Jupiter. So no, nothing on the surface would survive, especially with how thin the atmosphere is. But the same radiation blasting the surface could create fuel for life in the ocean far beneath the surface. All right, on to my study area, the Bright Plains region. So below and on the right, is a planimetric global mosaic of Europa. This is just a bunch of the best resolution 
uh, pictures of Europa stitched together to form a map. And this base map was originally projected into a simple cylindrical projection at a 500 meter resolution. However, I did end up projecting it into a different projection. It ended up being like plate curry. So Europa has extremely interesting surface features that can be studied to better understand what lies beneath the surface, but also how the moon itself works. And for the past year and a half, I've been meticulously studying the Bright Plains region, which is right here on the left. And this small piece of the surface has the highest concentration of features and grants us planetary geologists with an ample amount of information from just one high resolution image. So I'll be briefly going over this for anyone that hasn't taken a class with using RTS Pro. RTS Pro is a geographic information system software developed by Esri. And this was the system I used to hand map all of the features in my study area. That image you saw in my study area is what's called a raster layer. Um, the image is pixel based and it defines space by equally sized cells that are narrowly arranged in rows and columns and composed of single or multiple bands. Rasters are well suited for representing data that changes continuously across the landscape. And they also provide a regularly spaced representation of a surface. So when it comes to balancing pixel size of a raster layer, the smaller the cell size, the smoother and more detailed the raster will be. As you can see on the left bottom right here, it has a lot more detail that you can observe. However, the greater number of cells, the longer it will take to process and it will increase the demand for storage space. If a cell is too large, like the one on the right, information may be lost as long, along with subtle patterns that can be obscured. So the Bright Plains uh, raster layer was made up of 500 meter uh, pixel size, which just means each pixel covered 500 meters of the surface. And although this seems low resolution, it's actually considered pretty high resolution for what I needed to use it for. Okay, so here is the result of three to four weeks of work that I did over the first summer after COVID hit. It was that summer where before all the variants hit and we thought everything was getting better. Um, I sat in like the front corner of the TC every single day for three weeks doing what you see on the left. So my first week working on this, I had absolutely no experience in ArcGIS Pro. I had never even seen it or looked at it. And I sort of spent that first week teaching myself how to use it and using modules that were given to me. And then by the end, the next two and a half weeks to three weeks, I spent mapping this over here, the bright plains region. Each of those lines that you see there, I hand drew every single one of them. <laughs> so it took a very long time and there were definitely highs and lows through this process. I at one point deleted my work, not just once, but twice, but three times <laughs> because no one told me that there was a save button for a specific tool. <laughs> but it ended up here and I'm very proud of it. This map specifically is um, color coded by azimuth, which is just means direction. So for example, the zero to 35 uh, degrees are in red and they are all from zero, which is north and then 35 degrees, which is like right about here. If I'm looking at you this way and you can see it, I dash it with the red ticks on what is on the right, which is a rose diagram. And this shows the circular distribution and frequency of directional data. And the most common surface feature azimuth I found is between 36 degrees and 75 degrees, which is the orange tick marks here. And you can see the frequency kind of spikes there. So yeah, after mapping all the surface features in this region, I was able to pick out and label the features based on what I thought they looked like. Um, some are more difficult than others, and most of this is still up for interpretation. So how these features form is still speculation and not facts, so I'm sticking with descriptive definitions of the features. However, I do want to walk you through the different surface features I identified, and we're going to start at the top with the most common one, which is a double ridge. Uh, double ridges are just two high relief peaks protruding from the ice sheet. And let's say if I were to cut, so this one right here, is the biggest one that goes across the whole thing. If I were to cut that one in half, 
it would look something like this. That makes sense. You have your two peaks like that and then your little. And then our next most common were uh, smooth bands, which are just linear bands with smooth uh, and they're smooth and featureless. And you normally have like an east to west orientation and those are the blue, all of the blue uh, lines. And then complex ridges, they're just adjacent parallel ridges or high relief peaks within linear bands. And you can see all those outlined in orange. Median trough ridges, they're wider flanking ridges of featureless material, and all of those are in green. And then finally, last but not least, are the photo ridges, which are just transitional features between surface fractures and double ridges. And they're the least common. I actually only found two of those. All right, so I'm just going to go in and now show you specific examples and kind of zoomed in of all of the features that I found. So this is the most prominent example of a double ridge. The yellow arrows are pointing to the two high relief peaks that I sort of showed you over here. And this double ridge in particular is one of the youngest features in this region. And we know this because it is cutting through everything, which means it forms after everything that's underneath it. And here is our next one, our smooth bands. Uh, this is right above the double ridge that I just showed you. Uh, depending on what part of the region you're looking at, they can be anywhere from two kilometers to 13 kilometers wide. And this is the widest of the four sections that I ended up mapping. Uh, smooth bands can sometimes be internally dissected by normal faults. And so up here, there's an orange arrow that I have placed. Um, this can be a normal fault or it could be a double ridge. I know it's sort of hard to see, and the resolution is not great, but does anyone have a vote for a normal fault? Can I get a raise of hands, anyone? We got one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, eight. Anyone for a double ridge? Zach, cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, these are complex ridges. These are a little bit harder to identify since they share a resemblance to smooth bands. Um, this they look slightly less smooth and their orientation is not usually east to west like most smooth, smooth band sections are. But in my experience, and not always, but in my experience, complex ridge orientation falls within the zero to 35 uh, degree range. Next is our median trough ridges. And they are a combination of what I like to think between smooth bands and double ridges. They look like a couple double ridges smushed together in the middle. And then the double ridge definition starts to fade out into sort of like a featureless material as you get further away from the middle. You can kind of see like right here in the middle, you have this sort of nice defined double ridge. And then as you go out, the definition gets a little bit hazier to see. And finally, the least common feature in the Black Plains region are our proto ridges. And these are the youngest features in the region. They're what I like to call baby double ridges. They are faint and not very defined because they're transitioning from surface fractures to double ridges. And I know I did put arrows, but it is kind of hard to see. If you can just see like this faint, like swooping arc lines right here, sort of what I'm pointing at. All right, so I prepared an activity for everyone. Uh, Heather, if you'd be so kind to pass along. So, as you know, I have painstakingly staring daggers at this small raster for a couple of years. And so I'm going to have Heather pass out that ra same raster layer. And I was hoping you guys could just see what you can and identify any features that you see. There are no wrong answers. This is all sort of interpretation. So, and I'm going to go back to my surface feature thing so you can see all of the descriptive definitions. And I'll give about five minutes for this. And if anyone would like to share their findings afterwards, just let me know. And for my people on Zoom, if you'd like to do this too, you can with the left map. Yeah. What do you see right on 
near the top. The the colored lines. I think the white right. lines. Oh, oh yeah, that's just a, an empty space within the raster. So there's just no data there. Oh. <laughs> This is more of the basic trade off. Yes. You don't need North Arizona, right? Yeah. Always, yeah. All right. Always fair up on any natural. That fire is back up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and feel free to tell me that I'm wrong, by the way, like labeling something. It's totally fine. If you have a disagreement of what you think you see, that's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I just have a question about like the yellow areas that are like the complex phrases. Mm -hmm. um, so complex widgets are a little bit harder to identify, yeah. mostly because I had to zoom in a bunch on okay. ArcGIS Pro to actually be able to tell the difference between a complex and right. a smooth band. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, complex ridges are going to be sort of that up and down north to south orientation, whereas smooth bands are going to be like a east to west. Oh, okay. So, like, even though, because it kind of like a conference because it's like, I'm thinking yeah. no, but they are individual like, lines. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. If you zoom in, yeah, they're all like individual lines. <laughs> so, these like standard, like, um, like, like, Categories for ice sheets, or like, or did you invent these categories like double driven? No, uh, these are. I did a lot of academic research. There actually isn't much academic research on Europa. There's like a good amount, but not much compared to like Mars or you know other. But yeah, these are definite like not definitions, but these are the ice sheet sort of um, features. features that they used in academic articles that I sort of like on okay. Earth and in. Space. I haven't seen. On Earth necessarily, but well, yes. But I did read something about how uh, this section of Europa is actually very similar to um, Greenland's ice sheet. They found things that are very similar. You might have said this earlier. Do they ever have the issues? Yes, it is. Well, it kind of ranges because I don't actually know, but it goes for I think they think about ten to fifteen miles. So, yeah, we're back here playing a game. We're trying to uh, figure out the relative age order. Um, oh. So, are any of those certain sort of feature classes like consistently young or consistently old? Yeah. Um, in no. my experience, not necessarily, except for the proto ridges. The proto ridges are the least common, but they're also the youngest overall, always. So like at average. Yes. And then I was doing an age analysis, I've been working on it. I haven't seen anything that has been specifically always younger or older. Yes. All right, is everyone good? Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. So, what was gained by mapping and analyzing the fracture history at all? Although, as tedious as this work is, it will it will help gather an understanding of the history of principal stress orientations and possible formation mechanisms of the abundant number of features on the icy shell. The analysis of surface features, even in an area as small as the Bright Plains region, can provide further insight or evidence to the observations of Europa's brittle plate-like movement over the ocean 
and or warmer convecting ice, depending on who you are. Uh, this geometric analysis of fractures provides a more thorough kinematic history and is proof in itself that this strange surface is extremely dynamic. And for any future work, NASA's Clipper mission is set to launch in October, 2024 and to conduct a reconnaissance of Europa and determine if the moon is in fact suitable for life. If all goes well, the spacecraft will arrive at Europa in April of 2030. As for future research, there's always more to do, but we are limited to a handful of old high resolution images. So until more information is gathered by the Clipper mission, all that can be done is more analysis and educated interpretations. But I do recommend if any of sophomores or freshmen are listening to go into planetary, it's really cool. And then last but not least, I would like to thank uh, some very special people. Uh, first, Chuck, of course, I'd like to thank you for taking me on and, you know, pushing me always to do my best. And then Professor Shannon White and the CGA for just always being there to help me with my meltdowns with ArcGIS Pro. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the geology department, all of you guys, you have been so supportive and I have had such an amazing experience here. And then the structure and tectonics research group specifically, I see a few of you in here, you guys have my whole heart, thank you. And then my friends and family specifically, I'd like to thank Terry and uh, Heather who were there when I started this project and always encouraged me to keep going. And I would also like to thank uh, one of my best friends, Emily Boyle, who's here to support me. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I was yeah, I so sorry. <laughs> Questions, anybody? I have a question. Yeah. So that example, I think the question that I told you was gonna ask this is a different one. I'm sorry. But um the question where you're like, is this a normal fault or a normal ridge? Is there an answer or do you have a theory? Like what do you think? I personally think it's a normal fault. Um but it's still an interpretation. We don't actually know necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, Nyla. How fun was it making that road diagram? Actually, I got a lot of help from that from my first uh, um, professor that helped me, who was my research professor. He's no longer here. He's the one that helped me make that. So I, it was a program, and so we kind of just input the data into the program, and it just created that nice rose diagram. So I I just have like a space one. Sure. <laughs> you said one person, you said that Europa was the sixth largest in the whole solar system. It's like 109 mm -hmm. out there. But you said that Earth was, I'm sorry, Earth's moon was actually larger than Europa. Did you say that? Mm -hmm. I think the other way around. I might oh. have mixed that up. I think it's the other way around. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so Earth, Earth's moon is smaller than that. Yes, I think okay, that's Because once you said it was the sixth moon, I was surprised to hear that. Yeah. And I, I think I switched that up on the thing, but yeah, that's the other way around. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Linda has a question. Okay. Ask her on mute. Uh, yeah, Linda, you can unmute and ask your question. Hi, Vera. That was great. I uh, really enjoyed it. So I'm over here in in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? They might have a hard time hearing you. Okay. Do you want to? I'll run over there and ask it for you. Or can I'm she sorry, look at the chat? Can she look yeah. at the chat? Yeah, she can. We'll ask. Okay. Have a conversation. I have another question. Yeah. So, one of the things you said earlier was that like, there's no evidence craters on Europa, or up there few, which is evidence that they're pretty tight behind. But there's the ice, right? So could ice ice flows, and I just wonder if ice could naturally sort of like erase craters without oh. plate tectonics due to ablation or flow or some diffusional process. But um, you know, we're not. I, I don't know. Just an idea that I had. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's the newer ice is constantly coming up yeah. from the and just breaking through the surface. Right. So it could just be that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, so the question, oh, you can see it online. Yeah.
Um, I will have to say I am not 100% sure. I, I spent my time staring at a monitor, not at the sky, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but it could be. I don't know. I don't know. It's one of the brighter ones because it's so light. It is, yeah. It's yeah, it's completely encased in ice, so it would be really light. Yeah. So a lot of us haven't been to Europe, but um, <laughs> about, like, how much surface topography do we think there actually is? You know, is it 50 meters, 100 meters, you know, a kilometer, or do we know? How sorry, can you say that? How much surface topography is there? <laughs> Really topographic release. So, oh, of the features. Yeah, obviously, we're getting shadows. Yeah. So you can see the double ridges and things, but you know, is it a kilometer high or, you know, is it like the size of a. It, yeah, it really it depends. Structure? It depends on which one you're looking at. The one in the middle that cut through that you guys can see on the thing, the huge one, yeah. that could be pretty, the re relief could be pretty high depending on you what you're. What, I don't. Going to get called out for misinformation. I I don't know. I don't know. I'm asking. We're all friends here. <laughs> I would say meters, not kilometers. I would say. Yeah, I wouldn't think it'd be kilometers. I don't think the ice is going to be strong enough. To support it. No. Yeah, so I would. I would bet hundreds of meters. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are deep, heavy shadows. Oh, no. I mean, we could actually do the math on that. We could. If we know the aspect of the spacecraft. Yeah. 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 On Zoom, uh, Pete asked, there are some very nice cross cutting relations shown in ridges. Are there any correlation between orientation structures and age? Orientation structures and age. Uh, so far, with what I have found, there are some correlations between, I would say, orientation and structures, but not necessarily age. Thank you for coming, Pete. It's nice to see you. <laughs> Uh, they, the interpretation of what the double ridge is, is that it's an ice dike protruding out of the ice. Um, I left that part out because it's, it's not, they don't have any proof of that. It's sort of just an interpretation. Yes. That's like coming up from the newer. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like, yes, like a fracture and then the double ridges form. Yeah. Is it kind of like a mid ocean ridge or thing kind of that? Yes, that's sort of how I think about it. Yeah. So, in terms of like life on the main moon and everything, and their mass is bringing out the new project, the worst trying to come to me, what exactly are they doing to figure out if there's life on the moon or not? Yeah, uh, so they are assuming, I talked about a little bit of the photosynthesis element of the organisms. There wouldn't be any like photosynthesis based organisms because you know everything would, if it was alive, some like organisms would be on the planet, it'd be in the ocean. So they are comparing it to um, like the creatures that live near those, um, I forgot the name of them, those vents deep in our ocean and they like, get their life force off of the nutrients and the heat that is coming off those vents, they're assuming that that's sort of the organisms that they would find on Europa. Have you seen the movie Europa? No, <laughs> I haven't. It's about a spaceship that goes there uh -huh. and they're actually squid. First off, the fact that you have done all of this work and some of it you were teaching yourself, who knows to that. Um, if, how many total features did you have? Uh, there was over 2,000, close okay. to 3,000. Um, I would be absolutely interested if you want to continue looking at it, even at this image, how to train it to automate to try to locate those, because I think that would be really interesting. That would be really cool. Uh, based on Kind of what you're seeing and what you're not seeing inside of this image, and some of the curiosity that we were talking about in, in the back. Um, do you, if if it was automated, do you think that there would be problems that the computer might find that that you just because it's it's looking for something that you have background knowledge on, and the computer would only be as good as you train it? So do you think yeah. that it would match up? Or 
I mean, at this point in time, I think it would probably be pretty similar just because we also don't know a great amount. Um, but I mean, my human eye is going to make mistakes. I probably made some, you know, here. Uh, but yeah, I think that could be a really interesting thing to try. I would love to see how that would work out. Was anyone like to share their findings at all? Yeah, so I'm thinking of this now. Yeah. And uh, doing the ISP, I was told that I was sort of a clumper. Uh, I put things together in sections. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm seeing is I, I like shaded them in because I see like large bands of things that seem like they could have occurred during the same time mm -hmm. as being like washed away yep. by other sections with different morphological traits. And you mentioned earlier tectonics. Is this like an ice sheet plate tectonic? Or is this, do we have any information or theories about what lies beneath that could be causing this? Uh, there are many, many uh, theories. I think specifically Collins and Nimmo, they wrote multiple academic papers on that. Um, but yeah, it could, some argue that it's plate tectonic, some argue that it's just newer ice that's protruding, some argue that it's, there's warmer convecting ice under the actual like shell that's like solid and it's like creating uh, the features on the surface as it like pushes up. Some think it's brine mobilization, which is just the saltiness of the ocean is, you know, getting in and causing those features. It, it really, there's many, there's many theories. Um. Can I ask what the blues were in your like first image? Yeah. Is it um, talking about ejecting salt into the atmosphere or water? Water into the atmosphere. They are, they think that was the explanation for why the water is getting ejected into the atmosphere. Was they think that there are possibly like plumes that are in the ocean. Thank you, Vera. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>